Sick of the fatigue and fog, fed up with the unpredictable flares, hangry from the super restrictive diets. Hello, and welcome to the Crunchy Allergist Podcast, a podcast empowering those who, like me, appreciate both a naturally minded and scientifically grounded approach to health and healing. Hi, I'm your host, Dr. Kara Wada, quadruple board certified pediatric and adult allergy immunology and lifestyle medicine physician, Sjogren's patient and life coach. My recipe for success combines anti-inflammatory lifestyle, trusting therapeutic relationships, modern medicine, and mindset to harness our body's ability to heal. Now, although I might be a physician, I'm not your physician, and this podcast is for educational purposes only. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. I am so excited and honored to welcome my distinguished colleague, Dr. Micah Yu. He is a board-certified rheumatologist. He is also completing his training in integrative medicine and functional medicine. He also happens to be an autoimmune warrior himself, and he is just a total wealth of knowledge and wisdom. And I'm just so excited to have you here on the podcast. I know we've been planning and had this in the works for a while, but it's hard coordinating our schedules a bit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, having doctors coordinate schedule is always the most difficult, but I am so happy and honored to be on your show. Yeah. It's been, we, it's just been in the works for, I think three or four months now. Yeah. So I always love to invite our, the guests that we have on to share a little bit about their story. How did you end up where you are? Yeah, like you mentioned, I'm a rheumatologist. And that wasn't my first career choice when I was going through school. I, it really just happened over the years as graduate. So it's going, it all started back in high school when I was first diagnosed with gout, which is not an autoimmune disease, but is an inflammatory arthritis impacted by uric acid. And I would, I was on a high protein diet back then. The Atkins diet was very popular. And then I went to college and would still get pains. And then somehow over the years between college and medical school, my pain started transforming to something that I didn't understand. I had pain in places other than the typical places for gout. I had pain in my TMJs, multiple joints at the same time, fingers, feet, toes, knees, any joint you can think of, I got it. And then I did go into medical school and I went to see different rheumatologists there, but they couldn't understand what I had. They knew I had gout, but they, my, all my antibodies were negative, but my inflammatory markers were positive. I went to see two rheumatologists, one at the academic center, one in the community. They still couldn't diagnose me. But when I went to internal medicine residency back at Southern California, I was finally diagnosed with spondyloarthritis. So I had two diagnoses. I actually have three because they actually put a needle into my joint and aspirated some fluid out. And then they found that I also had another crystal in the joint as well. So I have three diagnoses, but I usually tell people I just have two. And what got me into integrative medicine was the fact that I went on a plant-based diet. And within three months, all my joint pain went away and went to remission. And what got me to rheumatology was because of the disease I had in the past. So this was not a straight shot that I thought of back in high school. This is something that has evolved over time. And because I got better naturally, now my, I feel like my life goal is to help patients balance out the field of traditional medicine with alternative medicine. And most of my patients come to me because they want to find ways to get off medications. Yeah. And what, I know we use some similar medications and how we treat inflammation in patients. What are the medications that people are most worried about that that they ask you yeah. to get off of? So I think most of our medications, everyone, most of the patients are scared of uh, one way or another. So methotrexate is usually one of the first line medications for arthritis and general autoimmune disease as well in rheumatology. And they're always scared of the side effects because they get a whole page of it, especially the nausea, vomiting, and also what else is there? Hair loss. They see that there's anemia or it can affect the liver. So they're very scared of those. And I usually tell my patients what well, it can happen. That's why we watch you very carefully. You get labs and we just, most of my patients don't have these side effects, but it can happen. They're also scared of the biologics as well. They're scared of the Humira, the Cosentic, all those rituximab as well. Yeah. They're scared of those for a good reason. So like on the black box label warning, sometimes there's cancer as a potential side effect. And again, a whole page of side effects. If I was a patient, I'd be scared myself, but 
I've had relatively good experiences with these medications. That's why they are a main part of rheumatology. Yeah. Do you, one of the things that, for instance, like my asthma and hives patients will be really concerned about our steroids. And I know that's something in rheumatology that will be used as a rescue too. So that's the other, we think about all the side effects and the scary things that come up and yeah. that's you probably get asked about that one too. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's a big one. I forgot about steroids. That's the biggest one in rheumatology and allergy medicine as well. So yes, steroids is something that patients are okay. I think in general for a short term, but long-term they get very scared of, and I am scared of long-term use of steroids as well which I don't, I try not to do in my clinic, but sometimes for very uncontrolled diseases, we do use that. So it's steroids, the side effects, weight gain. Some patients don't get that, but weight gain can happen. Adrenals are shot. They are not, they're relying on the exogenous steroids, diabetes, coces, so mental health issues, anger issues can happen. So many different issues can happen from steroids, increased risk of infections as well. I have patients that have come to my clinic and they are just, they are having all these side effects. Yeah. Increased risk of infections is huge with steroids. And I think that always has been my concern, certainly with some of the biologics, especially you mentioned rituximab. That was one that came up when I got really sick. It was in the conversation of what might be used and And my bias on my side of the immune system coin is I help a fair number of patients who have been on rituximab that their immune systems may have some like lasting problems. So I help order their infusions to replace the immune system that's missing or put people on IVIG. So that always makes me like nervous along with the steroids, like you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Rituximab is a big one. That's probably one of the that's the one that's used in the FOMA treatment and the cancer treatments yeah. as well. So that's yeah. one that we don't always use. That's not our first line in rheumatology, but it is in the conversation, like you said. Yeah. And there are some instances when we are dealing with really significant inflammation, that fire needs to be put out before it creates greater damage. And so we're always weighing this equation in our head of, okay, what is the lesser of two evils or what, how can we try to get you relief with the tools that we do have available. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the challenging part of doing, I think, alternative medicine and traditional medicine. I just coined it integrated medicine because I blend it. It is. It brings them all together. It integrates them. It's such a great word. Yeah. So it's, it's weighing which, what's the priority of the patient and what's going to bring them the fastest relief, how severe the disease is, uh, what's the path, what's their priorities? What path do I go down? That will balance out the two Mm -hmm. things. So that's always the hardest part. How I think of your approach too, it's like, you have these different aspects of training that are just equipping you with additional tools that you can add into the mix, which is really cool to have all of those different options of kind of the lifestyle aspects, which have worked so well that we've talked about have worked well for both of us and many of our patients as well. And things that have been passed on through millennia in some cases with traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda and healthcare or schools of kind of medicine. Yeah. And like just Chinese medicine and Ayurveda, these have been around for centuries or even thousands of years. And it's unfortunate that society in the past, like 40 years, 30 years has really disregarded them. Even in China and Asia, they're more going towards more Western medicine as well. And there's so much wisdom there. Yeah. There's not as much evidence as compared to our pharmaceutical drugs, but there is evidence out there and there is value in it. It's just, you know, it's the way that society has gone towards, but patients have been healed by Ayurveda. They've been healed by traditional Chinese medicine as well. I grew up, my father was a family medicine doctor, MD trained. My uncle is a pharmacist that turned into an acupuncturist and traditional Chinese medicine doctor. So I grew up seeing both fields and I saw the value of both. Yeah, this is, I just see so much power in this idea of and as opposed to or. What are all all the options that are out there? And then, like you said, how can we personalize to right. each each, per, each person's culture and their, um, their goals of care? Do you have specific tools from traditional Chinese medicine or Ayurveda or some of these other aspects that you 
really enjoy like incorporating in your practice? Yeah, I'm not a traditional Chinese medicine expert. I didn't go to school for it, but I certainly refer to acupuncture all the time. Awesome. I do use herbs sometimes for RA as well. There are, there's some of them, uh, you can see the literature online. It's a thunder, it's in the NIH as well, but it has helped some of my patients. And also Ayurveda, I'm not an expert in either, but I did get some training through the Andrew Weil University of Arizona's program. I do use adaptogens in my clinic, but beyond that, I need to go to more schooling. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it interesting though? Like I, so there's this concept I will post about from time to time that I think we encounter so much in medical training, but this idea of sometimes you don't know what you don't know, and then you learn some and you realize, oh my goodness, there's this whole other world out there of how much, you know, enough to know what you don't know. And then enough to know that you're an expert. Yeah. And yeah. I think we've talked this frustration sometimes that there are a lot of folks out there who are still in that first box. They don't necessarily know what they don't know. Exactly. I, yeah, I, <laughs> that's what the education that I've had over the years has really taught me. It's the more education you get in this healthcare field, the more humbled you become. Like when you, I, when you went to your uh, general residency, you saw, oh, allergy, like you didn't know much about allergy. And then once you got an allergist, you were like, oh my gosh, immunology, allergy is so complicated, but it's so <laughs> whole other world out there. Yeah. yeah. And then, wow, it's like, I had to go through so many years just to become an expert in immunology and allergy. And that's how I felt about rheumatology as well. And going through this fellowship and functional medicine has opened me up to this even bigger world, but it's even harder now because there's no one guiding me in a way. I'm learning on my own. Mm -hmm. It's harder than I would say rheumatology fellowship because in, at least in like the traditional fellowships we have in medicine, there's algorithms, there's guidelines, and there's a lot of published papers over and over again that are rigorous. But in integrated medicine, there are papers out there, but they're, but they're not sometimes not as rigorous as the traditional medicine that we have. And, but you realize that you don't know that much and there's so many ways to help people and and when I was going through training in medical school and residency we found even from my like attendings they're like oh natural past it's not Evan's space like towards them but not come out like I realized there is value to naturopathic medicine we can work with them there's so much value to be gained from there and with functional medicine you know we've discussed this before functional medicine is a wild wild west yeah. anyone with some sort of healthcare degree so it can go into functional medicine. You don't have to be a doctor. You could be, whether it be a chiropractor, a dietitian, or anywhere in the field, a nurse, you can be a, and go into functional medicines. I think there's value in that too, but there is a certain way to practice it because I don't like seeing patients going home with 30 supplements yes. and that's not what I do in my clinic. So th there is a balance to be made. So mm -hmm. I think the, there's value in all these fields. It's mm -hmm. about understanding how to utilize them so that there is a proper way of treating these patients because you don't want to, I don't chase numbers in my clinic. I treat the person and I see what the risks and benefits are of the traditional and the alternative medicine ways of healing. So it's really humbled me. It's, and it's still very difficult. Like I have to watch these lectures over and over again sometimes, cause I don't know what I'm getting myself into. It's, it really is what you're describing is this need to put your kind of critical thinking hat on. And you really are forging this path in an area of like you said, that is the wild west. And there, I think my biggest gripe has been those folks who come into the functional space or the integrative space and don't necessarily know what they don't know, but then our patients end up giving over a lot of money and for some of these things that really may not be the best, the best route or in that's where I get frustrated sometimes with, for instance, we've talked, my biggest gripe is food sensitivity testing. And so that's my, my example that I fall back to. And so that's why I am so excited about working with leaders like yourself, where we, you have that robust, amazing, amazing wealth of knowledge with 
the immune system, which is incredibly complicated. I kind of joke with allergy fellowship. We got to like week four of the immunology textbook. And I was like, oh, we got this. This is no big deal. And then week four, it was like the proverbial what hit the fan. And I was like, we're not in Kansas anymore. What are all of these receptors and cytokines and chemokines and PAMPs and DAMPs and all these acronyms? that you need to know. And it is, it's like drinking water under the fire hose. And that was that reality check of, Ooh, there's there, there will never be a shortage of something to learn, especially in immunology and the time we're living and practicing in this field. Yeah. And it's evolving too. Well, that's the hard yeah, part about it. So it fast. It's evolving and immunology, basic immunology is hard enough. Like when I went through medical school, it didn't make any sense to me at all. And in rheumatology started clicking, but then when it started clicking, things start to change with science too. And then you have, and then I learned about the integrative medicine part. Like there are, there are programs out there with like chiropractors and naturopaths. They, they learn about immunology too. And then they talk about other aspects of immunology that do make sense as well. So I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm bombarded by information now from both sides. And it's so hard to keep up. Yeah. So keep turning yeah. away and I guess managing our minds around our expectations. Yeah, yeah. It's I know it's we need doctors like you and me to get into the space because there needs to be a balance in the space, especially people that understand immunology and have been trained in it. It's there's just so much out there. It's, it's difficult to grasp sometimes. And I'm always playing catch up. I yeah. feel like I just need to take a week off of work and to learn everything, compress everything and figure out what's real and what's not with what people are saying. Yeah. I have, I've mentioned at home, I would love to take a little sabbatical essentially and get dial in kind of intense study retreat type idea. I wonder if there's a way to get that paid for. (laughs) I know it's, it'd be nice. I I don't know that the university is going to be super excited about that without research funding. (laughs) I know it's, I know in order to learn all this, you literally need, I think another year of dedicated learning. Yeah. Cause there's so much out there. Like we, we, you know, our supplements there, there are like this whole field of herbs. And then also like in the integrated space, there's peptides, there's ozone therapy stuff. Like I'm still looking into to understand wow. like how to use it. What's the evidence in this space? To oh, be that's responsible. Not- yeah. So when yeah. I see my patients, I tell them, you know what, I'm pretty much, no, there's no one teaching me in rheumatology how to do this. I'm teaching myself mm-hmm. and the things we can try this, it's part, it seems like low risk, but if you see anything, side effects, let me know. In my practice, there are patients who come to me who say, I'm okay with medications. Let's go for it. And yeah. they don't care about integrated medicine. Some come to me with they're open to integrated medicine and they want, they're open to meds as well. But there are those that don't want any meds at all. And those are the ones that push me the hardest that will yeah. push me to learn even give me the motivation to learn even faster because I'm going down this rabbit hole of what can I do for you? And some patients I have successfully put them to remission or greatly improved them without the use of medications because lifestyle does work for, I mean, there is a role for lifestyle for everybody as a foundation with diet, a mind, body medicine, but there are those who it just doesn't work as well as other people. And then, um, and they're on medication sometimes and they're still not as improved or they don't want to be on medications as well. Then you're, the question is what's next? And you don't want to leave these patients out there on their own because then they get all this misinformation too. So that's the, I think that's the balance of doing what I'm doing is trying to figure out like, what can I do for these patients? Cause it's- yeah. Agree. Coming back to that, the biases that we all have, and we all walk through life with a set of lenses on. And so much of like our conventional training has like this lens of that is colonialism and has that bias in it. And I think it's, it's something that I have to continually come back to trying to keep that bias in mind. And I think of it as I will often disclose to my patients, like if we're talking about ster- uh, supplements, like my own personal experience slash bias against supplements because of the, it, the liver injury I dealt with. And they say, Hey, this is something that I have a hard time, like separating myself from, and I do the best I can. And, and I have an open mind, I try to have an open mind, but 
inherently this is part of like my life experience and how I walk through and how I practice. And I think that's something I try to impart into the trainees I encounter too, of just trying to check our biases, just like we're trying to do that all the time with racial biases and gender bias and all of these other ways that our brains try to trick us. Yeah. Drug-induced liver injury is a real thing. Did you experience that yourself as a patient or did or yourself as a patient? Yeah. So I essentially saw some really awesome Facebook marketing for a superfood supplement. It was shortly after I was diagnosed with Sjogren's and I was like totally in type A mode. Like I got to, I got to take control of everything. So I started on this like green smoothie regimen and I was like really hitting the Peloton hard, trying to do all the things. And I was maybe like six weeks into this regimen and started getting fevers and then fevers persisted. And then one day noticed that my urine was really dark and I was itchy and I like looked at the whites of my eyes and I was like, Ooh, this is not normal. So when it got checked out and sure enough, like my liver enzymes were in the many of hundreds and ended up with a biopsy that this is where you never want to be the interesting patient, right? That's one of the first things you learn in medicine that they ended up looking at Ohio state. And then they're like, we're not quite sure we're going to send it to the NIH. And I was like, this, what just got real and what all the viral studies and everything were negative, what they came to the determination of based on the biopsy results, but also how I improved when I stopped the supplement was that was likely the cause, but we don't know which ingredient or if it was some sort of contamination or what have you. Yeah. Drug induced liver injury is something that I tell my patients with supplements. I'm like, you can get this. I've seen it myself in residency too. People come in yeah. and they're taking something from out of the country or some herb or supplement, and then they come with um, elevated liver enzymes. And you're like, what is it? And it usually narrow it down to that herb or whatever they're taking that they don't know. They don't know what the ingredients are. And it's very real with these supplements. I mean, it, the thing is that it can also happen with medications as well. It can happen with any of our medications, statins, or even some simple... Yeah. And all yeah. stuff like that too. So sometimes patients could have the wrong, like their SNPs, their epigenetics mm-hmm. isn't conducive for that specific ingredient. And then you just get yeah. it. And unfortunately there, I think there's ways to test for certain medications, but for supplements, I don't, I, I don't know if there's something out there as a database to test for these things. And what's so hard too, is From a legislation standpoint, if they're like, say someone has a problem with Tylenol or another prescription medicine, there are databases where that gets essentially entered into and tracked. And there isn't as, there's not that accountability on the supplement side of things. Like I emailed the company and they were just like, yeah, no, pretty much no response. It is what it is. But I think as I, I still take some supplements now, but I think as I make that decision, and what to take or what to try, I take that mental pause button and just say, okay, how do my symptoms feel? Are there any concerns? Talk with my healthcare providers about the risks and benefits, like someone well-informed like yourself or my other colleagues that are trained in integrative medicine and using supplements and and just keeping our, you, you go in with your eyes open. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Something as benign as turmeric can also give you drug-induced liver injury as well. And I, that's one of, one of my favorite supplements. It's very real. Fortunately, supplements, you, anyone can just buy off the market and anyone can prescribe supplements these days. So it's another wow, wow yeah. arena as well, where patients are being prescribed things from just even the coaches or whatever, and yeah. then they're being recommended. And sometimes... People don't know what they're doing, but they heard that it works and they try it. Yeah. And sometimes it, something happens to them as a side effect, like a drug induced liver injury, but they're not even thinking about that. They don't even know how to tie it in. They don't even know that they should be looking for these symptoms and no one's tracking their labs. So that's the dangerous part. Yeah. And the, it's easy to be wooed, like myself, like it's easy to be wooed into this sense of like false sense of security and safety because natural does seem like it, like natural, it feels good to us. And like feeling is huge. How we feel and how we connect with another human being, that's part of that healing experience. So 
I don't say that to poo it. I think it's incredibly powerful. We just, just helpful to have your eyes open and know that be aware of potentials in any situation. That's why I tell my patients what I treat supplements like drugs. So yeah, we're going to try them and see if you have any side effects, let me know. Cause there can be side effects, even as something as a multivitamin or like turmeric, cause you might be reacting to the filler, the ingredients in there. Mm-hmm. We don't know every individual is different. Every microbiome is different as well. Yeah. Ah, oh, fillers drive me nuts. That's it's so hard. I have had a few patients come in recent memory a lot of discussion about polyethylene glycol and PEGs and polysorbate, which is in everything and was suspected to play a role in some of the reactions related to some of the newer vaccines on the market. And so it's so hard because these things are pervasive that muddies the water. (laughs) I I know. I know sometimes, yeah, it's everywhere and it's so hard to get around. Yeah. So as you think about your approach and to the overwhelm, when you have a patient who is in this state of, oh my gosh, there's just so much, what is maybe some advice you would give to them to, you know, how to approach things and to minimize that overwhelm? Yeah. I think first of all is go to a doctor, go to a medical doctor and you know what? That first doctor might not be the perfect doctor for you. You might need a second, third, and fourth opinion. If you don't agree with what they say, you can seek alternative medicine as well. See if you agree with that. But I think it's always important to have a MD or DO's interpretation of things. Mm-hmm. As and just to it's a it's the most Evan space out there. It may not be the perfect way of doing things for you as a patient but at least you need that perspective. And it's, I have some patients you, who have seen their rheumatologist and they didn't like them and they went years on end um, not seeing another rheumatologist. They, but the time they come see me, they're very sick or the joints are all disfigured. And there's no one perfect way out there of doing things. You, there are so many different diets out there. You're going to see so many marketing, Facebook ads about diets, even plant-based diets uh, doing many wonders. Yeah, plant-based diets can help a lot of people. Some patients that does wonders, it's helped and done wonders for me and my patients. You'll see things about paleo diets. You'll see about Mediterranean diets. These are all things that are great, but if it doesn't work for you to the point of you being in remission or where you want to be, you need to consider other ways of healing, whether that be medications or some other form of alternative or integrative medicine. I think marrying both fields of allopathic or traditional medicine with alternative medicine is the best way. Having both opinions in your team. Don't do it alone because you can get sick very fast, especially in the autoimmune disease space. And some of these, if you, and going online, you can look up all these symptoms. You might think, oh, I have Sjogren's or lupus, but you Little do you know as a patient that infections can mimic these symptoms and cancer can mimic these symptoms. That's why it's important to go to this specialist to get the right diagnosis. When you go down this functional medicine path, if you don't see an actual doctor in the space, sometimes you might have an underlying cancer or something serious. And that coach or that practitioner that's in this functional medicine space is not even thinking about cancer. They're looking at your fact that you have a leaky gut you have some type of nutrition and then you're just not doing the right thing. By the time you actually go to a medical doctor, it's too late. Yeah. So I'm going to quickly summarize. So finding a trusting therapeutic relationship with an MD or D as at least part of your care team is paramount. And then add in those supporting folks as well. Knowing that there's more than one way to find remission is huge. I think that's so empowering. And then the other kind of summarizing, we were saying like getting curious, being open-minded, coming with that and, or that I call it this abundance mindset of, okay, what are all the things we can do to find help? And I think circling back to that therapeutic trust, giving, I think it can be really hard sometimes for our autoimmune and chronic illness patients to trust us because the system has failed them in so many ways. Like we're so siloed and many times 
patients have had their concerns dismissed or ignored, or if labs are normal, said, okay, go on your way. But there are those of us out there who, there are many more of us out there who, if given the benefit of the doubt, we're there to help you. And we do care about you. And we do want you to reach your goals of care and feeling better and, and trying to do that in a way that's consistent with your values. Yeah, I agree. Sometimes it's the system itself in medicine. Unfortunately, we're in traditional, when you enter the insurance model, you're forced to only give 15 minutes, 10 minutes of visit sometimes. And it's not the best system, especially if you have an autoimmune disease or complicated disease. And unfortunately, these patients are not given the attention. Sometimes their questions are ignored and you're stuck. And that's when patients may go off the rails trying to find their own way and sometimes go down the wrong path. So if you are in a system where you're not happy, you need to look outside the system and see what other doctors are available that fit what you are looking for. They're out there. And even in the integrated space, there are many ways of healing, not just because two doctors, two integrated practitioners got similar training doesn't mean they're going to practice the same way. It's not like allergy and immunology or rheumatology. There's no algorithms in the space. Everyone does something different based on what they learn. Please don't give up and continue looking for what you are looking for. Thank you so much, Micah. I appreciate your time, your expertise, and I can't wait. We're going to have to get another one of these on the calendar. <laughs> of course, Sarah. I'll be love, love too. Yeah. And I can't wait. I know you've talked about getting your voice out even more, but in the meantime, where can folks um, find, you post like the best information, where can they find and follow you so that they can see all the cool things that you're sharing? Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. So my handle across all social media is my autoimmune MD. The my is after my name, Micah Yu. So it's my autoimmune MD. And then the website's myautoimmunemd.com. This website's getting revamped right now. I'm coming out with a podcast. So just follow me on social media. I wasn't sure if that was the public knowledge yeah. yet. So cool. Yeah, <laughs> I was alluding to. One. Yeah, autoimmune disease and integrative medicine. Um, Kara, you're going to be on there too. I'm going to invite you on the show. So <laughs> um, I can't wait. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's going to take a lot of work, but it's going to come out. So just follow me on there, follow my newsletter on my website, and then you'll get the most up-to-date information about what I do. Fantastic. I cannot wait. And I look forward to continuing to follow across the years as we embark on this personal and professional journey for us both. Yeah. Yeah. I think our disease has both been, I think, Initially a curse for both of us, but now a blessing because we're using it to really pioneer this field for other yeah. patients. Yeah. We figured this is the circumstance, right? It is what it is. Like we might as well turn it into the best batch of lemonade that we can. Yes. Anti-inflammatory lemonade. Yes. <laughs> maybe with some turmeric in it. <laughs> yeah. Natural lemon. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, maybe some matcha too. I like the matcha. I like matcha lemonade. <laughs> oh, matcha lemonade. I'll do that. I'll make Good. that today. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Micah, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Take thank care. you. You're welcome. If you have found this information helpful and empowering, I would strongly encourage you to hop over to www.crunchyallergist.com and subscribe to our weekly newsletter where we dive into all things allergy, autoimmunity, and anti-inflammatory living. Thanks so much for tuning in, and I look forward to talking again next week.